So I am not a climate scientist. I am a psychologist. I'm a social scientist. Uh, and so my interest and my domain of expertise is in people's opinions. That is, why do people believe what they believe about climate change, not what is the evidence for it? So here's my first slide, which has a slightly different tone that we've had so far. So um, I have an opinion about climate change like most people do, but I don't, know, I don't know anything about it, really. Like that is, I know some things about greenhouse gases, CO2, whatever, but I'm not a climate scientist. The, the basic research the things that climate scientists know uh, is outside of the grasp of most, pe most people, okay? Uh, they, spend, they have specific training, they have PhDs, they're also very smart. They spend their days working on this. So like, you know, if someone came into your office at work and pretended to know more about what you, know, what you do with your days, you would probably be kind of like put off by that, right? Uh, the thing with climate science is that despite the fact that it's complicated, there's something different about it, right? If, if you want to build a bridge, right, you get an expert to do it, right? You would not drive across a bridge that was built by somebody who wasn't an expert, right? Because we trust in experts when it comes to bridges. Uh, if your car breaks down, unless you happen to have some mechanical training, you go to a mechanic. You can maybe change the oil yourself, but for a lot of things, you've got to go to the mechanic to fix it. The car is obviously a lot less complicated than the climate. Right? But we still don't listen to experts in the climate. Uh, if you want to know about why people believe what they believe, you might ask someone like me to talk about it. I, I'm not as smart as climate scientists. I do know a few things about it. But the, the, like, the fact that you're here seems to imply that you have some regard for expertise. Okay? And we do. Everybody does. We listen to experts in relevant domains. But we don't, or many people don't, in the context of climate change. And, and this, is, this is a fact that I'm not going to allow refutation on. There is a remarkable uh, amount of evidence for a scientific consensus around human-caused global warming. Okay, so I'm not going to dispute it. There's just, that's what the evidence says. Uh, despite that fact, a lot of people don't agree. Right? They don't believe that the globe is warming, that humans are causing it. And so the question is, why? This is what I'm going to discuss. Why is it that people believe what they believe? And, it, and by the way, when I'm talking about that, I'm not just talking about why do people disbelieve, but also why do people believe it, okay? From a psychological perspective, there's very similar things because it's not as though the people who believe it know more about climate science. They're not climate scientists either, but they just agree with the scientists, okay? Now, the, the way that people usually talk about this, the, the, probably the thing that you're thinking right now, if someone were to ask you, why do you think that people don't believe in climate change, you'd probably say uh, it's because they're dumb, right? They, it's either they don't understand what I understand about the world or they don't care to understand it. They're putting their heads in the sand, okay? And so one of the most common ways that people talk about this is that people don't believe in climate change because they're being deliberately ignorant, okay? Uh, and what I'm going to argue is that that's wrong, okay? That that is not a good explanation for why people don't believe it. It's not a good explanation for why people do believe it. It doesn't explain hardly anything at all, okay? Um, and so to simplify this a little bit, what I'm going to do is use two analogies, okay? And the analogies pertain to a way to think about how people reason about the world, okay? So I'm a psychologist. I'm interested in generally why people believe what they believe, not only about climate change, but about other things. And so this is, this is a kind of broader perspective. So if you think about uh, how a lawyer reasons. What happens is a lawyer has a conclusion, right? The person's guilty or innocent, and then they form the evidence around that conclusion, right? For a lawyer, it's not about what's true, right? It's about winning the argument. That's what their job is. And one possibility is that um, when, we, when we decide what we want to believe, when, we, when we're reasoning about some sort of topic, that's how we approach it, right? That we don't actually care that much about the truth. What we care about is being right. What we care about is winning arguments, okay? And so this is the good lawyer idea, that people reason like lawyers as a kind of fundamental, at a fundamental level. That's the way that we reason, and we, we believe things that we believe because we're too good at it. We're basically too good at deluding ourselves into believing what we want to believe, okay? And I think you could probably see how this is something that, the way, uh, a way in which people talk about people's beliefs about climate change, probably, right? But there's an alternative. 
uh, oh, so one way to think about this would be partisan stupidity, right? It's a, f a specific form of stupidity that pertains to people being overly ideological. They don't care about what's true. They care about their political predispositions. They care about the tribe that they're in, whatever. They care about uh, forming uh, opinions that are consistent with what they want to believe. They don't care about the truth, okay? Uh, but there's another alternative, right? That people think like philosophers, right? That philosophers deeply care about what's true. They spend their time trying to figure out what's true, but we're not very good at it, right? We make mistakes. We don't think enough. We think about the wrong sort of things. We don't know the underlying science, obviously, because we're not trained as climate scientists. And so the difference here is that one possibility is that people believe what they believe because they're just too, too lazy or too incapable to you know, represent all of the information about what's possible in the world. Okay? And so these are very different forms of error. Right? Uh, on this side, people are being deliberately ignorant. Right? And on the other side, the, the bad philosopher side, people are just kind of being, uh, they're, they're, they're falling prey to falsehoods without you know, really knowing it. Okay? So let me give an example of what I mean by this bad philosopher idea. So here's a question. A uh, bat and ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So don't yell at your answer. <laughs> uh, uh, a lot of people say 10 cents. Probably 10 cents pops into your head. Uh, of course, 10 cents is not the correct answer, right? If it was 10 cents, the bat, which costs $1 more than the ball, would have to cost $1.10 and then totally be $1.20, right? The correct answer is 5 cents. So what's interesting about this problem is that most people get it wrong, right? But it's not because they don't care about the answer. I mean, they don't care that much, but they don't, uh, it's not that they have some sort of partisan inclination. The reason that people get it wrong is because they don't think enough about it. Right? They don't bother to check the, that 10 cents is the wrong answer. They don't bother to double check their answer. They don't think enough about the problem. Okay? And so if this were to explain why people believe what they believe about climate change, then what you'd expect is that you know, the reason why people you know, disagree with scientists is because they lack education, they lack the basic scientific knowledge, or they lack critical thinking. Okay? So that's one possibility. Now, what I'm going to do is show you a piece of central data in this area that refutes this idea, uh, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the talk explaining why it doesn't actually refute the idea. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I appreciate that that is probably going to be kind of confusing, um, but you know, we're going to work our way through it and hope it works. So I, I just want to make sure, if you don't understand what this figure says, the rest of the talk is going to make no sense whatsoever. Okay, so make sure you understand what I'm saying here. I'll try to go through it a couple times. It's pretty straightforward, but I just want to make sure that you keep focused on this one thing. So here's the question. Uh, there is solid evidence of recent global warming due mostly to uh, human activities such as burning fossil fuels. Okay, and so this is, this CRT refers to the cognitive reflection test. That's the bat and ball problem. It doesn't really matter. If you score high on this test, you're smart, you're a critical thinker, you're, you think more logically, you're, uh, uh, more reflective, et cetera. If you're low, then you're just not as smart, okay? And so here's what you find. In the States, Democrats who are smarter are more likely to think that global warming is a problem and it's something that's happening compared to Democrats who are less smart, okay? So that, pretty straightforward. The people's intelligence, that is Democratic uh, individuals who are smart, agree more with scientists. And this is the key bit. The next thing I'm gonna say is the most important part. It's the opposite for Republicans. Right? The, the smartest Republicans are the most likely to disagree with what scientists say. Okay? And the, the less smart, the, that is, political polarization is greater among people of higher intelligence on, on the topic of climate change. Okay? So this is an extremely remarkable uh, piece of uh, finding. Um, and it's very confusing and hard to uh, explain. What it seems to suggest is that people reason like this. Right? That it's not about the truth, because obviously, if, in cases where, if it were about the truth, people who are smarter would be more likely to get at the truth, right? Because that's, the, that's what they're trying to do. Intelligence would help them do that. Uh, but you, that's not what you see. Intelligence is just making people more polarized around global warming, which indicates that maybe people don't care about the truth. Maybe they're just trying to, they're just using their capacity, their intelligence, to convince themselves that the things that they want to be true are true, okay? So that's a plausible explanation for this. But like I said, I'm going to spend the rest of the talk telling you why it's wrong. <laughs> okay? Um, but it's going to take a few steps to get there. Um, so the first question is, 
is it specific to climate change? So if it's the case that people uh, believe what they believe about climate change because they're deliberately ignorant, we should find other cases where they're doing that, okay? That is, it's implausible that people are being uh, um, deliberately ignorant on the topic of climate change, but not deliberately ignorant on other contentious scientific issues, for example. Okay, so if you look at other issues, it will tell us something about climate change. Okay, so that's the logic for the first part of the talk. So here's what we did. This is a paper that you can get online. It's not published yet. Uh, is we, we, we got a representative sample of Americans. I do have some data from Canada, uh, but you know, it's easier to get big data uh, samples from the states, which is why we do that. Uh, it's also cheaper. So, so this, is a, this is a sample of, uh, um, of Americans. And what we did is we replicated the same finding. Other caveat is this. I'm Canadian, and I understand that blue is conservative and red is liberal, but that's not what we're doing here, because this is Americans. In America, blue is Democrat, and red is, con is Republican conservative, and so I'm sticking to those colors, okay? So this line means conservative, this line means liberal, okay? But this is the same finding as what, we showed, what I showed you before. This, the smartest people are the most polarized on climate change. Fortunately here, even the Republicans are now agreeing a little bit. Uh, that depends on what sample you have. It changes over time. It, we are getting increases in people's belief in climate change over time, so that's a good sign. But you still see the polarization, okay? Now, the question is, do we get the same findings for other contentious scientific issues, okay? So what we did is we asked people uh, 15 different questions, okay? I'll show you what the actual questions are uh, when we get there. I do have a caveat, though, okay? the likelihood that I'm going to now say something that at least one thing that every single one of you disagrees with is very high. It's probably about 100%, actually. Uh, you probably have some sort of opinion that's somewhat cons inconsistent with what I'm going to say here, so don't get mad at me. I don't see any tomatoes, so that's good. Uh, but the, the whole point is that they're contentious issues, and so that's built into the study, okay? So, reminder, this is what it looks like for global warming. What we want to see is the same pattern of results for other, uh, other topics. And that, what that would su suggest is that people are actually just deliberately ignorant. And that would mean that it's an intractable problem. But what I forgot to say is the reason why we do this work is that if we want to change people's minds, we have to understand why they have their, they made up their mind in a certain way, obviously. Uh, it's unstated, but that's the, that's the point. Okay, so here's the first question. Uh, among both humans and other animals, there are only two biological sexes, male and female, with no ambiguity. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, there is huge ambiguity in animal kingdom. There's some species actually change sexes, uh, the clownfish, for example. People are born intersex. Uh, I'm not going to go through an explanation for every single one of these things. It's a climate change talk. But anyways, uh, in every case, a higher score means the more pro-scientific opinion. The thing that scientists in the relevant domain would agree with, okay? And so here you see liberals who are smart are more likely to agree with scientists compared to liberals who are less smart. But what you don't see is a negative correlation for conservatives, right? It's not that the smart conservatives disagree. They, they, there's not a strong association, but it's not the same as you see for global warming, right? This, this negative correlation that you see there, you don't see that, uh, you don't see that for this question, okay? Uh, what about um, nuclear power, right? It is, in fact, relatively safe and a viable source of energy based on what scientists in the relevant domain say. Uh, in this case, you don't see negative correlation, just people who are smarter tend to be more consistent with what scientists say. The gender wage gap is due entirely due to sexism and nothing else. Nothing is ever due to one thing and nothing else, by the way. Sexism does pertain to the gender wage gap, but there are other things that relate to it. Uh, and here again, you don't see a negative correlation for liberals. You don't find the same pattern as you see for global, global warming. You don't see that, that open jaw. There's no, there's no evidence that people who are smarter are rejecting what scientists say in these other areas. So what about these other ones? These are all areas, by the way, that are as contentious based on what people say as global warming, but you don't see the same pattern, okay? So here's everything else in one big slide. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna go through them all individually because it doesn't matter, because they all say the same thing. Okay, well, I'll come back to Big Bang, but every, you can see that in all these cases, generally there's just one consistent pattern People that are smarter have the more pro-scientific opinion, okay? Stereotypes are sometimes accurate, sorry to say. GMOs are not hazardous to your health. Uh, homeopathic medicine is water, doesn't do anything. 
uh, vaccines don't cause autism, IQ is moderately heritable, there are consistent differences between women, when men and women on the SAT, they're pretty small, they've been decreasing over time, doesn't mean that women are bad at math, but there are differences. Testosterone does provide an advantage for athletic performance. Uh, acupuncture, there's no evidence that it works that well, at least. Uh, essential oils smell good, but they don't, don't, don't do anything. And finally, if you detox your body from chemicals, you have to let yourself on fire. Okay. Uh, the, there's chemicals in the body, so you can't detox your body from chemicals unless you let yourself on fire and you become dust. Okay? So, uh, the only one where you can see the slight exception is Big Bang. W but this line is actually straight. Okay? So there's no negative correlation there. There is one exception. From this entire list of issues, there's one exception where you see the same pattern for global warming. It's evolution. <laughs> right? For evolution, the conservatives who are smarter are less likely to agree that evolution is a biological reality. Okay? And so I'm going to come back to this later after I talk about fake news. But the fact that these are the two issues where we see this one pattern is extremely revealing as to why it's there. Okay? Evolution and global warming. You don't see it for nuclear power, you don't see it for all the other issues, only those two issues. Okay? And that tells us something which I'll get, come back to later. Okay? So two issues, that's it. And what that tells us is that this idea that people are being deliberately ignorant probably isn't true. Right? Because if they were, they would be more, they would see more evidence of that in other areas. The fact that we only see it for two issues this says, suggests that this is not a general proclivity. There's something unique and different about global warming and, by extension, evolution. Okay? Now, what you might be thinking is, so if these people who are smarter are more likely to reject global, uh, global warming, then maybe they should be more likely to reject information about global warming or accept bad information about global warming as in this case. So this is a fake, uh, this is fake news. This is a fake meme. It's not actually fake news, it's a fake, uh, uh, it's a made up meme that someone created. So the, the, the trick here is that this, this uh, cover, which is purportedly from 1977, is from 2001. It's Photoshop, okay? And scientists did in, in fact agree on the reality of global warming by 77. So it's a falsehood in addition to the, being a Photoshop, okay? And so what I'm gonna talk about next is another way to test this general idea about, about deliberate ignorance. And the context is fake news. Okay? And, and the reason that this is relevant is because people in this area have said the same thing. That the reason that people believe fake news, political fake news, is because they're political hacks. That again, people are being deliberately ignorant about it. And it's not just people in the media that have said this. Uh, Dan Kahan, uh, who uh, I know quite well, has argued, for example, that individuals are motivated consumers of misinformation. If you can't read it, that's all it says. They're motivated consumers of misinformation. Okay? And so what this means is that people believe what they believe about fake news because they want to believe it. In the same way that it might be the, the case that people reject climate change because they're de being deliberately ignorant, you should find the same evidence in the context of fake news. Okay? If that's a general proclivity, that's what you should find. Okay? Um, so let me just be clear about this. Now what I'm going to talk about is research on general fake news. And I, I'm not, I'm, I, short, I shortened this part of the talk um, because I didn't want to get too much into it, but uh, I'm happy to talk more about it if people have questions. Um, when I say fake news here, I just mean general political content. Okay? So it's not specific to climate change, uh, although I do have one example of that afterwards. It's just general, like Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, uh, child sex ring, in the, a coffee shop, whatever, those, the crazy things that people saw during the election, okay? Uh, all, and by fake news, I mean specifically made up, like fabricated uh, uh, news content. So it's not just things that people disagree with, like actually false content is what I mean by fake news. Misinformation, okay? So this perspective that people take to be an explanation of why people believe what they believe about climate change applies to fake news. And the idea is that people want to believe things that are consistent with their political ideology. And they actually use their reasoning, their intelligence, to convince themselves that the things that they want to be true are true, which is the same reason purportedly why the smartest Republicans are the least likely to believe global warming. Okay? That's the idea. But the alternative is that people actually do care about the truth, uh, but they just you know, don't think that much about what they see on social media. Right? Like you, most of the time you're on Facebook, um, it's pictures of dogs and babies and stuff. Uh, and when somebody shares a fake news headline, it's not because they are looking at it from a partisan lens. 
they're just not thinking about it nearly at all. They're just kind of sharing things that interest them and that draw their attention. Okay, so the, the, in this case, people who can reason well are going to be better able to discern between what's true and false, not more likely to obfuscate uh, or stick their heads in the sand. Okay, so this is a reminder. This is what things look like. And it kills me to do this because I have like dozens of slides and many papers on this. And I'm distilling it down to one figure <laughs> for the sake of simplicity, uh, which annoys me, but uh, that's what we're going to do. Um, uh, so anyway, so this is the pattern for global warming. Okay? And so what we're going to do is we're looking at politically consistent and inconsistent fake news. What you should see is the same pattern. right? If it's consistent, people should be more likely to believe it if they're smart. If it's inconsistent, they should be less likely to believe it if they're smart. Because they're better able to convince themselves that the things that they want to be true are true. right? That's what you should see. That's not what you see, right? It's, it's, the, it's the explanation that you'd probably expect if you were asked about it. People who are smarter are better able to discern between what's true and false, right? They use their actual brain to do what the brain's supposed to do to figure out what's true and false in the world. Isn't that great, right? It's not that, that this suggests that this is not because people are being deliberately ignorant because they don't, you give them explicit political content and they're not being deliberately ignorant. So it's unlikely that they're doing that here, okay? And we also uh, ran a study in Canada um, during the election on the same topic, okay? In this case, with this specific meme in the study, okay? We have other content that wasn't about climate change, but I'm gonna show you the data for this one meme because it shows the same pattern, okay? In this, in this case, the, uh, the thing that we're interested in is not whether people believe it, but whether they would share it on social media, which is a case where you'd actually expect people to be even more partisan, okay? Uh, but that's not what you see, right? Here's the pattern. You don't see a positive correlation here. So this is, by the way, Canada now, so I changed the colors, uh, you see? Uh, conservatives are blue and liberals are red. Uh, and these, I mean conservatives as, as people who identify as members of the party, okay? So these are conservative party members, these are liberal party members, uh, and these are the smarter ones and these are the less smart ones, okay? I'm trying not to make fun of people. Um, so you can see here the liberals who are uh, smarter are less likely to, sh to be willing to share the meme about climate change. The conservatives who are smarter are not that much less likely, but they're definitely not more likely, right? They're definitely not being more active in pushing out the false content, right? Which is very different than this, right? Because these people also are more likely to disagree that climate change is a problem, okay? And you, you'll be excused to be confused about why that would be the case. And that's why I'm going to explain for the rest of the talk. Another thing, the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, that will explain this conundrum relates to this. So there's a study that people ran on specifically the consensus on climate change. Okay? And so HE refers to highly educated. So the only people in this sample are those individuals who are on the top, this top part of the distribution. The smart people who are disagreeing with climate change and are conservative. Okay? And what you find is that if you tell people who are smart and conservative, and also smart people who are liberal, uh, that there's a consensus, they actually agree. They don't reject it. They're, they say, oh, okay, great. Right? They, 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 they actually are saying the, that they you know, agree that once they are told that there's a consensus, they're like, ah, I guess there is a consensus on it. Right? Which tells us something really important about these two issues. Right? Because of all the evidence that, we, that I, I told you about that suggests that it's not about partisanship per se, that it's not that people are, are sticking their heads in the sand, it's not because they're being deliberately ignorant, that the way that people, people typically uh, deal with this sort of information, even if it's highly political, is that they, like, they try their best but then they kind of fail because not, we don't know everything in the world. Um, what that suggests is that you know, it's not an intractable problem. Right? that there's, it's possible to convince people who don't agree with the, the, uh, the science around climate change, probably the reason why they believe what they believe is because they've been given bad information. Okay? So how do we explain these two patterns? Okay? Let me just think about this for a second. So I'm going to summarize. The first part of this part of the talk, when I went through it before, took like 40 minutes. 35 minutes, and this is taking 25 minutes. So there's, so I lost 10, minute, 10 minutes somewhere, uh, and I don't, I don't remember what I didn't say, so I'm going to go through to make sure everyone understands what I'm talking about. So, okay. So we have this crazy pattern where in two cases out of 16, 
the smartest people are the most polarized on evolution and global warming. Okay? But at the same time, we know that these people are less likely to believe fake news. That's political. They're less likely to share specifically uh, a meme that's false about climate change. They are willing to accept if told uh, that there's a consensus on climate change. Okay? So why in the world would they be less likely to believe in climate change? Right? They, they, should be the most likely, they should be more likely to believe it like anybody else. Um, and the answer is false expertise. Right? It comes down to what people have been exposed to. And so the, the, um, the remainder of my talk is now history and sociology. Okay? It's not about uh, the psychology anymore, that's the psychology part. The, the question now is, how is it that uh, the information about global warming has is, is been so uh, uh, screwed up that even the smartest people on one side of the aisle are believing a complete falsehood? Okay? And to, to understand that, you have to go back to history a little bit. So this is James Hansen. He testified in the Senate in 1988 about the reality of global warming. Soon after that, uh, groups such as the Global Climate Coalition were put together. Okay? Um, this is one example among many. The Global Cli Climate Coalition was explicitly funded by oil companies and uh, car manufacturers, and among others. Okay? Um, their explicit goal was to deny and obfuscate the science around climate change because it was in their interest to do so. They had a vested interest. Uh, it was, they didn't want the policies to change that would hurt their bottom line, and so that's what they did. By 2002, uh, this disbanded because you, it was no longer acceptable for vested interests to be in the game in that sort of way. What we have instead are groups like this, the Heartland Institute, okay? The Heartland Institute started, uh, and initially they were funded by Philip Morris, and what they were doing was working on um, uh, obfuscating around the uh, tobacco causing cancer. So they were first funded by the tobacco companies, they used those tools to then uh, move to climate change and obfuscate around climate change. Of course, they know now that you can't disclose your funding. Uh, people have figured out some of the source of the funding. It's, of course, what you expect. Exxon funded them in the past. They get funded by conservative uh, political groups. Vested interests fund them. And what they do is produce misinformation about climate change. And the way they do that is very specific. It's, it's specifically to create false expertise, okay, to fill the gap. And remember, false expertise is important because if you don't know how, if you can't understand something, you ask an expert, right? We do not understand, unless you're a climate scientist, the, really they understand the underlying research behind climate change. So we have to trust somebody. So what they did is they created a, a system where they would create different experts so that people could, uh, could you know, it would be hard for them to dis decide, you know, what's true and what's false. So let me give an explicit example. So this is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change front paper, the front page of their 2013 physical report. So this is a very dense scientific document. Uh, I think it's around 600,000 words. Uh, it's got lots of charts and figures and so on. Uh, and it reports the evidence for climate change for policymakers. It puts it together in one big document, okay? Uh, what the Heartland Institute did, given this what I'm talking about in terms of false expertise is they created their, their own report. They called it called, uh, Climate Change Reconsidered 2 because there was one before. Uh, it's called the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, brevity was not part of the thing. They wanted to have something that was similar to IPCC, obviously. Um, and so they, what they have here is they put together a list of 20-ish uh, um, authors for the report. Of course, the, the, the report that's uh, by the International Gov uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has way more authors than people who are actually experts, obviously. So that's the one. This is the authors for the summary for policymakers. Here's the authors for the technical summary. Here's the authors for the first, for the introduction, second chapter, and there's multiple chapters. I won't go on. Okay, so there's lots of authors here, fewer authors here, and just to get a, uh, a sense of who it is that's uh, publishing this work, uh, oh, sh I forgot that I, I misspelled uh, the dude's name. Uh, and didn't change that, so that's my bad. Um, so this is the lead author on the report. Uh, he hasn't published a paper since 2003. He does have a PhD in geog geography, but he was paid about $12,000 a month uh, by the institute leading up to the report, okay? So you might say that he's got a conflict of interest there, uh, but there you go, okay? So that's the expertise. There's a difference in expertise. 
Um, but for an individual, even a really smart individual who is uh, being kind of pushed this thing, by the way, they mailed these to school teachers and educators, okay? They just, they sent the document and they sent it around everywhere. And so even a smart person would, be, would have a hard time distinguishing between the two documents, okay? This is, this is the IPCC document. This is just one random page off the do, in the, from the document. This is one from the NIPCC document, okay? So they have charts and figures. They have citations. They talk about science. It looks like the same thing, right? Especially if you don't know the underlying science, which is true for basically everybody, uh, it would be almost impossible to distinguish the actual research in these two documents, right? Um, also, in addition to that, it would be a huge uh, uh, time crunch. It would take a lot of time for individual scientists to go through all of the stuff and debunk all of it, which still wouldn't matter that much because, again, we don't understand the basic science anyways, and so it's just going to go over our heads, okay? So what we did instead was we just compared the language of the two documents, okay? Um, and the logic is simple. If, if you have a document that's scientific, you use a typical way of writing, okay? And if the documents are equally scientific, they should have equally scientific language, right? Uh, and so that's what we did. We analyzed every single word in both documents. Uh, it was about a million words in total. And we looked at various different things, okay? So uh, one example. So this is the IPCC, that's the experts. This is the NIPCC, this is the Heartland Institute, the policy document uh, from the vested interests. And so for example, uh, the IPCC document uses fewer or more tentative words and fewer emotional words, okay? Um, and, you know, so the differences seem small, but these are always small differences because it's across all the words used in the entire document. Um, and the thing that's remarkable about this is that this document is saying, we are in danger, you know, the globe is warming, uh, and they're using nonetheless more tentative words and fewer emotional words than the document that's saying, everything's cool, don't worry about it, right? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a profound difference, actually, if you, think, if you consider the underlying messages of the two documents, okay? And then there's a bunch of other things that, that pertain to like, typical things that you see in scientific language, and they all differ. And these, just as a, to explain the, the size of the differences, um, it would be like looking at a, a, a scientific journal article, uh, that's the, the expert report, and then the other document would be something like a middle school textbook or something like that. That's about the size of the difference in scientific language. Okay? So, so they look very similar in terms of the underlying stuff, but the language they're using is extremely different, and it makes a lot of sense because these are scientists and these aren't, right? Um, and the other thing about this is that, I mean, it, making uh, uh, bolstering false expertise doesn't work by itself, okay? It's not gonna only, it's not, you, that doesn't get you all the way there in terms of creating enough muck that even smart people can't wade through it, you, have to, you need the help of politicians and political <laughs> elites too, right? And also media companies, right? So um, there's so much, not only is there a false expertise out there, but there's vested interests that are pushing it in front of people, and so it's not surprising that people are confused by it, okay? So Fox News, for example, uh, when it comes to climate change, they use a far more dismissive tone than MSNBC and CNN, right? Specifically as it pertains to consensus, not only do they often not mention it, but they actually explicitly reject the consensus, which is, which is a falsehood. It's actually a falsehood. It's not a matter of opinion. There is a consensus on climate change, okay? Um, and so it's not surprising that people, particularly Republicans who watch a lot of Fox News, are the least likely to believe that climate change is real and a problem, okay? Uh, if they watch CNN, MS, NBC, then they're, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're accepted, right? So these are people that are politically engaged. They care about the news. Uh, they're smart. Uh, and they're being t given bad information. That's it. That's, that's, the res that's the solution to the conundrum, okay? And so I talked about evolution before, and this is really revealing because the same pattern is evident there, which I'll just talk about very briefly because it's a climate change talk. So in 1987, um, a Supreme Court ruled that you can't teach creationism in schools because it's religion, separation of church and state, you can't do it, okay? Soon after that, what was uh, created was something called the Discovery Institute, which is exactly the same by way of tactic as the Heartland Institute. They're funded uh, by the Donors Trust as a conservative group. That also, by the way, funds the Heartland Institute, uh, National Christian Charitable Foundation and other conservative family. By the way, the Walton family, the people that own Walmart, they fund both of these things 
terrible people. Uh, I go to Walmart too. I mean, we all go to Walmart. I, you know. um, and so the tactic is here. They, that is, it's not an explicitly religious institute. They, know, they don't say anything about religion on the website. Uh, it's a conservative think tank explicitly. But what they do is they create uh, a false, they say that there's two sides. There's the biologists who say that evolution is true, and then there's all these other scientists who are like, you know, I'm not sure that so much about evolution. Of course, they're, they're not actual scientists. So like as an example, this is the, uh, the leader of, their, uh, of the institute, uh, Stephen C. Meyer. He does have a PhD. He was a college professor uh, in philosophy, not in biology. But he's never published a paper on biology ever in, a, in an actual journal. There's no, there's no research supporting what they call intelligent design, which is, uh, means God did it or whatever, um, that's, there's no evidence, there's no research on it at all, okay? They just have what appears to be expertise to someone who is, you know, justifiably confused by everything because they have jobs and they can't spend all their day, you know, researching evolution or whatever, right? Uh, so like as an example, here's his, uh, his one book. It has 23 citations, which is not a lot of citations. And I went and looked at them. Most of them are like, this is wrong. <laughs> so they're... <laughs> not actual citations. So not actual research published on the topic, okay? False expertise. And again, in the context of, of uh, evolution, you see the same thing. Pushed by political elites, elites, this is the Vice President of the United States, saying that the theory of intelligent design provides the only even remotely rational explanation for the known universe. Um, the, the funny thing about this is that even the proponents of intelligent design would be like, no, no, no because they're not trying to explain the universe, they're trying to explain the origin of species. <laughs> so he was even wrong in his falsehood about that, so uh, whatever. Okay, so let's summarize. Uh, I hope I didn't lose anybody, um, but I will try to summarize it so it's clear. So there's this crazy pattern of results where the smartest, the most analytic, the most kind of, uh, the best critical thinkers are more polarized on climate change. Okay, but it's not because they're using their thinking to be deliberately ignorant, right? What this tells us is simply that the, uh, the political worlds that we inhabit are so disgustingly polluted with misinformation that even the smartest people can't wade their way through it, okay? What it tells us is that the, you know, Republicans and conservatives in the states and probably to some extent here as well, uh, liberals and conservatives, are just living in different ideological worlds and they have different experts. Right? It, I mean, it just so happens that some experts are actual experts and other ones aren't, but they have the appearance of expertise, and if you don't know the basic science, it's hard to distinguish between who is and who is not an expert. Right? I know how to do that without, I don't need expertise in climate change to know who's an expert because, you know, I am also a scientist and I know what a scientist looks like. Okay? I know what published research is, I know how citations work, I know what is a good and bad journal, I can figure that stuff out, but for someone who isn't trained in that sort of stuff, it would be very difficult to do that, right? And, and this world, these different ideological worlds are constructed by people with vested interests, okay? Uh, and there's a, it's not, I'm not making, like, that is, the, the history that I, that I uncovered, that's open, like that's, it didn't, I could, you could look it up yourself. Like it's, it wasn't, it doesn't take serious scholarship to figure that out. There's a straight line between oil companies and misinformation about global warming. It's just, there's a straight line, okay? It's not contentious at all. So here are my conclusions and recommendations. The first is that we need to be more charitable to people on the other side of the aisle, okay? That is, it's not that people are being deliberately ignorant, right? So it's not that, um, if, if, you, if you grew up, I mean, I also grew up in a logging town, uh, and most of my family thinks that global warming is a hoax. Um, even my brother, although my brother works in the oil industry, and he uh, used to think global warming is a hoax, um, now he doesn't, but he doesn't care because he works in the oil industry and he has to get paid. So, uh, um, so we don't have that argument anymore, but you know, he, he did come around. Um, but it, the biggest difference has come down to information exposure. I mean, you have to, I mean, it, I'm not, I don't want to take personal responsibility from anybody, right? Like, you're responsible for curating your environment and looking for good sources. But if there's this much, million, that there's millions of dollars pushed towards confusing people, we shouldn't be so surprised that people are confused. And we can't be blaming them for it, certainly, okay? Uh, what we need to do is look to the people who are causing the confusion in the first place, right? Because they benefit from the fact that we're fighting on the ground about it, right? And ignoring them. We, we blame our neighbors uh, who have different opinions. 
when we should be blaming the person who's putting all the shit in front of them that's wrong. Okay? That's my, that's my conclusion. The other thing, though, is there's, there's, some, there's some positive uh, good information here, which is that uh, people can change their minds, right? It's not that people are deliberately ignorant. It's that they're getting, you know, they're getting bad information. So if we give them good information, if we have talk series on climate change, if people who disagree would show up, then, you know, then it might actually have an impact. It's not intractable. That there's actual possibility that people will change their mind. And people have changed their mind. We have positive movement on people agreeing more uh, that in the reality of climate change over time. So that's good. Okay? So it's a positive message there. Uh, I'm going to conclude with that. I want to thank, uh, I, have, I was given this slide to thank all the people who helped put this thing on. Uh, there's, look at all these things. Isn't that great? Uh, and there is another talk on the 27th. Sounds like a lot of fun. So do come to that as well. Um, two quick questions. So the first one is just if you could define, because throughout your, your presentation, you interchange the words smart and educated. Sure. So, so when you're talking yeah. about that with people, who are, like, how was that defined? Yeah. And then secondly, if you can talk about like this, the, the idea of these competing experts and what we often are told is that we need balance. Mm. Right? So yeah. if you could kind of talk about how it's not real balance when there's you know, the, the consensus and the group, but just kind of like yes. how we can debunk that whole message about that we need balance. Yeah, that's a t great question. So the, um, I was, I was um, for simplicity, just lumping together a bunch of different things for in terms of education, intelligence, and so on. So there's lots of different components there. In terms of the pattern of results, it's the same. Like that is uh, the, the graph I showed you where it's like where you see People that are smarter have, are, when a Republican, are less likely to believe in climate change. You see the same pattern if you look at education levels, like how much schooling do they have. You see the same thing if you look at basic scientific knowledge, like do they know what atoms and like all that kind of stuff that don't pertain to climate change, but like basic like high school level stuff. Um, you look at, if you look at IQ tests, you see the same thing. Or if you look at what I looked at, which was analytical thinking, whether you reflect on your intuitions, you see the same. But those are all different sorts of concepts but they're just not relevant basically for the, for the distinctions that I'm making here. Um, so, so, but great question. Uh, on false balance, um, absolutely. In fact, uh, there's some great research on this where people are extremely confused by false balance. Like it works. Like if you, uh, the, part, of the, part of the thing is that um, the, uh, people in the media really want to feel, to have the appearance of balance, which is good in lots of cases and actually some of our biggest problems are that there is a lack of balance on certain, uh, um, um, from certain sources. Um, but in the context of climate change, it's a false balance. And people, it, it, it really does confuse people. Uh, and that is one of the, definitely one of the sources. Having debates about something that isn't debated in the, in, by scientists makes it seem like it is being debated by scientists, and that confuses people. So it's a huge problem, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to probably refer myself to the Homer in your presentation there. Okay. <laughs> well, I think, but, but, well, we're all Homers, that's the point. <laughs> I'm including myself. But um, I'm just thinking back, but you get some of these people that are not doing this, they don't believe in God, until they're on the deathbed, and, you know, all of a sudden they become religious. You get that story coming out about autism and measles shots, and how that's needed. Even though it was proven for a fact by many studies, and Scientists that it was false information, the guy fights the data to get it published. People still believe that autism is related to those shots. Mm -hmm. And it really comes down to people's fear rather than anything else. And how much do you think in regards to climate change? Because one of the first messages that came out is global warming is happening, we're all going to die in another 50 years. So it kind of scared people into wanting to believe rather than really thinking of becoming all these homers. Right, so it's uh, a good point. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the way that fear works in this domain is that it draws your attention to a thing, right? So there isn't good evidence that fear is going to cause people to be deliberately ignorant. Uh, but it, it, there isn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, so so there, that is, uh, I've, I've got numbers of papers on this. So, the, there's, there's hardly evidence that motivated reasoning actually has that big of an impact, that people are deliberately ignorant. But what it, what it comes down to is focusing your attention on specific things. So you can, it, it's not going to cause you to convince yourself 
like what you want to be true is true, but it will stop you from thinking about something, right? It'll, it'll shut off the brain. Uh, if, you, if you are afraid of something or if something is really emotive, uh, it'll cause you to share something without thinking about it on social media or whatever. Uh, and so what people do is they avoid a topic that scares them or that they don't want to talk about for a variety of reasons. And so it doesn't, it doesn't really increase people's belief, and it might in some cases, but the, that's the general trajectory. Uh, if someone disagrees, and I want, I want to know what he has to say about it. Uh, do you want, do you want, uh, do you have, uh, you have a disagreement or, no, you don't want to talk about it? You, you can ask me afterwards if you want, um, send me an email, uh, I want to hear about it. Hi. Hi, thanks, that was great. Uh, my question maybe is a little bit outside of your expertise, but uh, I've seen, you know, one of the things that we worry about, uh, those of us that are committed to educating people on um, issues, contentious issues, such as climate change, or I've run into this, um, looking at uh, gender differences and, and such, uh, is that we um, often are um, preaching to the converted. And so you've shown quite well that we need to get people that are disagreeing in the room. Yeah. And I guess I just wondered if you have any advice on how to do that. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, that I don't know. I mean, this, this is the... That it, that seemed to be the fundamental problem is uh, getting people engaged, especially if they feel like the, uh, if, especially if you use the impetus of engagement is something they disagree with fundamentally, which is that it's a big problem that you need to worry about, right? The, the questionable fear that we talked about just now. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that, unfortunately. Like, um, I mean, the, there, there has been movement on it. And so the, I mean, the only thing that you can't do is stop, right? Uh, and so the more information out there that's, that's solid and that suggests that is consistent with what scientists say, the more likely that people will come across it and might incorporate it. So there's no silver bullet though, unfortunately. Hi, Greg. Thank you for your presentation. My question, comment first. The Democrats in the US are spending like drunken sailors begging for money and Donald Trump is laughing at them because he's alone in the issue. And what? I don't understand why they think they can get away with that. Why can't they band together? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, this is also similar to Britt's question, which is I have no idea. Uh, um, yeah. Um, the, the, um, the difficulty with all these issues is that uh, it takes coordinated efforts and um, they, coordination helps if people have a monolithic opinion. Uh, but reality, unfortunately, is complicated. Uh, and so the closer you get to what, you know, what's true, the less likely you're gonna have people kind of uh, um, across all the, you know, believe exactly what you believe. So even in like, so if you look at any kind of scientific literature, um, scientists rarely agree on anything. They can only agree on basic things, like the global warming human caused it, you know, what all the things are, the specifics of all that. A lot of huge contention all, everywhere, and so, you know, uh, it's unsurprising that it's hard for people to band together. That's not really an answer to your question, but, you know, uh, yeah. I did my best. Okay. So it's all very interesting, and I definitely agree we have to be compassionate with people who don't agree with us. But the, the solution that I heard from you, though, um, is, Tell them that there's consensus. What other solutions are there when you do have all those other people in the room? Because some of us frequently do. Yeah. And so you're standing on the door of uh, climate change and I are be they uh, on the scale of uh, educated, uneducated, in between. They are denying. How do you get through? This is really, really important. Right. So one thing I should say, a caveat, is that when I, like, my explanations are about what is generally true. So nothing in psychology is true for everybody, ever. Like, if I, the simplest psychological claim, like, I, if I slap someone in the face, what are they going to do? That will differ. I can have a pretty good estimation of they'll probably get mad at me. But, you know, like, the, every, people differ on lots of different things. Uh, so for some people, there's nothing that you can do. Like, it's just, they, they care too much about it, you know, whatever. But that doesn't seem to be generally true of everybody. That is, it doesn't explain the typical person uh, that you knock on the door. 
Okay, and so my my so my answer to is that um, things like consensus messaging do work overall. They don't work for everybody, and they aren't going to work immediately for everybody. Okay, and so what happens? Like, w or, this is the experience that we have when you argue with somebody, right? You get into debate. They never agree with you at that moment. And you can think about it yourself. You don't agree with someone at that moment. When you change your mind is a week later, you know, a month later. The information does go in. It has an impact on people. Uh, and so it, it's, it's not, it's not an um, uh, intractable problem, but you know, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to always listen to everything you say uh, and that it's easy to change people's minds. So you know, I don't have a good answer for you, but that's, that's what the research says, at least. Yeah. yeah. Um, Gord, I got a quick question for you there. Um, so, did uh, you and your colleagues look at the um, views of independent voters in the U.S.? Yeah, it's got partisans there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they they kind of fall in the middle, basically. And I mean, the the thing is that independents in the U.S. are not actually independent. Like, there's very few of them that are. Most people who identify as independent are actually Democrats or Republicans, but they prefer to identify as independents. And so if you look at their ideological stances, then you can usually distinguish them, and they look like regular Republicans do, or, or Democrats, depending on their stance. Um, my research suggests that the, uh, the, there is no dispute of the scientific aspects of it. What is in dispute is the grade six uh, arithmetic aspect. Uh, you measure temperatures around the world and you come to the conclusion, is there increase in global warming or isn't there? And my own conclusion, now I just tell you, I got six years at university and in psychology here, and uh, I'm a former member of Mensa, and I've come to the conclusion that is climate change, global warming, is the hopes of the 21st century. And all you have to do to find out is it's all on the internet. And all you do is you go on the internet and you study both sides. Now what you should be doing here is give two sides. You can't just give one side. You've got to have two sides in any other side. So, um, so, here's my, so my suggestion to you is this. Uh, the, the things that you read, the sources that you read on the internet, uh, what you should do is go and back to see who they are and where they got it from. That is, the, my, my, my guess is that whatever you're reading that suggests that it's the hoax uh, is funded probably by vested interests. The, the Heartland Institute funds about 70% of all the books that are anti-global warming. That's, one, that's only one think tank. The, there, if, if you can find uh, a document, some sort of scientific research that says that it's a hoax, something that's published in a reputable journal that's been peer reviewed, uh, please do send it to me uh, or anybody else. That, but that, the, um, the whole point of the talk is this, right? I'm not a climate scientist and I'm not gonna spend my time dealing with it because I know that they're smart, I mean, at least as smart, probably more smart than I am, uh, and they spend their day thinking about these things. I know that I know a lot about the shit that I think about during the day, so I can assume that they probably know a lot about what they're thinking about every day and the, the premise of basically the talk is that uh, usually we care about that, right? You wouldn't cross a bridge that was not built by an expert. If we have people who spend their day and who are smart and they say one thing, I, I, I cannot muster the confidence to say that they're wrong. Dis despite being a confident, you know, dude, but that's not my expertise. This question is about the, all the different categories you gave us early on and the amount of uh, investment that's gone into creating that imbalance mm -hmm. or the, the gap in yeah. the job that you call yeah. it. So why the, why the particular investment in climate change and evolution? The other issues were high stakes as well. Yeah, that's why. Um, part of it probably is just an accident of history. So um, for climate change, um, it, so there's, uh, part of it gets built on momentum. So there were, there were specific things that happened uh, in the 80s that led to the, uh, the creation of these think tanks. And that was when the think tanks became a big, played a bigger role in American politics, and they had a bigger influence on public opinion, and then once they kind of create the momentum to push the public towards a certain thing, then the public starts taking the, the banner on themselves, 
and that, that kind of that creates the, the bubble and it makes it bigger and people adopt it. And so you can't just make that up whole cloth. Like if you did put a lot of money into you know, GMOs, you probably would, could create lots of obfuscation, but you need, you need lots of, it requires a huge amount of kind of effort to do that and like it probably is difficult. So they hit on two things and who knows uh, in the future what they'll hit on. But yeah, it's a good question though, I mean, yeah. Um, hi, I was just wondering, uh, uh, near the beginning, uh, there was a map of Canada, and uh, I read correctly, there were those who uh, used in climate change and those that didn't. Mm -hmm. um, now, I was just wondering if you could speak to that, there's no variation. <laughs> right, that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Without getting into trouble? <laughs> um, this map here. Yeah, so. Uh, Part of it is like what I said about the, the ideological bubble, right? What information are you exposed to? Uh, who's telling you what? Uh, you know, what, what, are, what are the elite, what are the politicians saying, whatever? And so there's a difference there. I mean, the, there's, there's more vested interests here in obfuscating about global warming than there is over here. And so that's, you know, that's one source. There's, there's, there's other things going on, obviously. It's not, but it's not that people here are more partisan than they are here, right? The, the, the same people, if you replaced, you know, at birth, these individuals, like, there's nothing unique about the brains of Saskatchewan people compared to the brains of Ontario people. So there's obviously something environment, environment that related to our, our, like, political environment that's causing the differences, right? Would you ever consider going on John Gormley? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have been on John Gormley. I talked about fake news on John Gorley, and it was actually my father's proudest moment. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was played at the mill, uh, and so they go, my dad and all his friends, they heard me on John Gorley, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes. I would love to. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, I, I really do quite a lot of scientific articles before, and, you know, some are written by one author, some are written by four or five of PhDs, and personally, a lot of times look at them and say, I think they publish this, it's garbage. <laughs> and some are even written by like 15 or 20 co-authors written in it. It's like they get bonus points by more authors <laughs> in it, I don't know why, but, and again, it's like, did these people even review this up? Even before they even <laughs> submitted it? You know, so, I don't really, I'm not really a fan when somebody criticized one paper over another one because one got more authors than another paper. I'm not saying you know, that the uh, oh. entire paper is true or not. You know, I'm not saying that, but I just don't make the argument of saying, oh, oh he got more offers, so he must be great right than the other people. Yeah. yeah, I guess, so it's a bit of a different thing. So I, for a normal paper, I would agree. Uh, but in the context of that report, uh, because it's a, uh, it's, a, it's like a review, so basically more authors means like more research was reviewed, basically. Um, it was put together by more people, that's, yeah. But, yeah, fair enough. Yes? I want to say that I disagree with what you're saying, and I'm concerned that you're doing it. Here's why. Okay. My experience, in including as a parent, and as a lover, as a friend, and as someone who works with people, and reading psychology and all kinds of issues related to disability. Fear doesn't interfere with your belief system. And so rather than saying, this is what people believe, I think it's, it's a different concept than what do people accept. And I do think there's a difference between saying they believe this as opposed to they accept. If you look at your map, for example, the purple, the darkest ones, are where people's living is dependent upon the fossil fuel industry. It doesn't mean that they're stupid and they don't believe the science. They just don't want to believe it because it's not going to be helpful to them. So my understanding of psychology and what I've read, by the way, I'm a lawyer. Um, I play hockey with lawyers. Is that fear They're terrible. actually actually governs most people's decisions about how they are going to portray what they want you to understand. So they're going to. It's not that their belief is. It's their fear is this. 
So they don't want to accept that because they're terrified. And global warming, global climate change, whatever you want to call it, is the most terrifying thing in the minds of young people in the history of this planet. And they're terrified. And so a lot of them don't want to accept because otherwise they end up giving up hope. So I like your comments on that, because I think that is a critical issue on how we deal with people. I ask them, what are you scared of? So, so that's, so uh, thank you for your take. Um, I think you're wrong. Uh, so so it, it seems plausible. Like I, I understand that it's, it, it seems like it's something that's true, uh, but we need to have evidence for it, right? I need to know how to, how to assess it. It, it. Just because it seems like it's obvious and it must be the case, doesn't mean that it is the case. So like as, one way to test that would be that if it's the case that, like you said, um, People, the people in northern Alberta, they, they are rejecting it. They're, ex they're denying what must like, seem so obvious to be true, but they're, they're sticking their heads in the sand, right? You, so people who are smarter should be better able to do that, right? That would be one way to assess that claim. Uh, but that's not what you see, right? The, the, here, they, this is a scary thing. Oh my God, there's a, there's a hoax about global warming, but the smarter people aren't, aren't that willing to stay. In fact, these are liberals. They're almost as likely to, to share it as, as, as these conservatives. Uh, you know, they have different vested interests in this thing. Um, if, you, if you gave me um, some way to test the claim, I, I would be happy to do it. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example using your own study. Okay. Okay. The smarter people, the conservatives, don't accept it. I think that you're being a little presumptuous to say they don't believe it. The more they know, the smarter they are about climate change, they read it all, they don't want to accept it because they know that if it's true, their lives and the lives of their loved ones are in danger. So I think that that proves what I'm saying. The smarter people know the truth and they don't want to accept it because they know the danger of it. Um, so, no, probably not. Like, it's just that, like, I, I mean, so I, fair enough. I mean, it's possible that that's true for some people, right? Uh, but my guess is that, so, so let's just, like, so this is how we, this, the way that you think I have to think about this uh, from a psychological standpoint is that what you have proposed are very specific cognitions thoughts that people had, right? That they went through the effort of looking at things, they have a specific fear of it, and that is what, you know, so they, that's a lot of things that has to be true at all at once. And so it's unlikely that those things are true for everybody in Northern Alberta, or even the majority, or even a minority of them, because it's unlikely that all those things would be true at the same time, right? It's just, uh, do you see what I mean? Does this make sense? Uh, so, so, you know, most people don't spend all their time looking up stuff about global warming, right? They don't, like, they, if, if, you, if you give them this stuff, like, uh, we have other research on fake news, for example, that shows that if you ask people, would you share this on social media, uh, they'll, they might say yes. But if you ask them, do you think it's accurate? The, for the same things, they'll be like, oh no, that's not true, <laughs> right? That is, and so it's not that they're sharing it out of fear or because they really want it to be true, but they, they share it because they don't think about it. Right? And then if you ask them about it, they're like, oh, yeah, I guess not. Like, you know, whatever. Um, and, and, you know, for, for this sort of thing, most people wouldn't click on the link. They wouldn't go look it up. They wouldn't, you know, that if, if, if your claim requires the underlying assumption that people are going to put effort into something, then you're almost always wrong as it comes to psychology. Uh, and there's decades of research on this. Uh, uh, so that, that's, it's irrefutable, basically, that, that, that one bit about psychology. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to add to what he was saying, uh, last fall during the election, I went door to door uh, handing out leaflets, and so I spoke with people. And uh, anecdotally, I can tell you that there were quite a few people who uh, agreed that there was global warming happening, but because it um, affected their livelihood, they weren't willing to support sure. that party. Yeah. And um, that's just anecdotal. Yeah. And it was actually for both 
uh, parties, like people who didn't like either the Conservatives or the Liberals, in fact, were frothing against them. They voted for the Conservatives because that's who was promising the pipeline. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a great point. I mean, what I'm talking about here explicitly is what do people believe about whether it's true? Do they agree with scientists or not? A uh, separate thing is, are they willing to do anything about it? And that's, you know, there's a whole lot of things that go into that, obviously. But that's a great point, for sure. Which probably gets back to part of what you're talking about. But, um. Well, just carrying on with what Larry said in this panel over here, um, whether, whether it's fear or whether it is they have a vested interest. Because you were saying that the people that are, are putting up, going to all the trouble of putting out uh, false information have a huge vested yeah. interest. Well, people that are working in the fuel industry have a vested interest. Yes, absolutely. So it isn't, you know, confirming what you say, it's not to their benefit to right. believe that. But to their benefit to believe the, the false information. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. That's a great point. And so one clarification is that it is definitely the case that some people are uh, doing things because they have a vested interest. Uh, although that doesn't mean that they necessarily believe the things, right? That as they, the people who are authoring the report might still recognize that the globe, they, they, with this whatever. So that, but that means a separate issue, but that still doesn't, that's not what I was trying to explain. I'm trying to explain what people typically believe in, you know, people on the street. Um, so, but there are definitely exceptions, always exceptions to everything. Yes. Hi, yeah, I was wondering if you had uh, any um, idea on uh, group identity. Like people are much more willing to accept information from people they identify with. I get into a lot of online discussions with people who are skeptical of climate change, and I like to bring up facts like I think it's Fort Bragg in yeah. Texas has transferred to something like 60% renewable energy. Mm -hmm. They've got a huge solar farm. And those are guys who are not generally considered in the world. Yeah. You know, they do it because it now makes economic sense. Yeah. And there are also a number of governors in the US who are Republican, but they have been faced with so much flooding and natural disasters that they say, well, how many months in every 500 year uh, uh, climbers can you have within a 10 year period before you realize right. something has fundamentally changed? So I, I find those kinds of arguments where you call people that belong to their own group have a lot more impact than if you're going to, you know, bring up something like David Suzuki. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and that, it comes down to what I was talking about before, about the separated ideological worlds, right? And so part of that comes into, you know, uh, where, what kind of information are you used to getting, right? And if, it, if it's from a source that's surprising, then it's going to be more likely to break into your, like, um, your purview of what you think counts as a reliable source, right? Uh, and so that's what it is. So they, they created false experts, uh, and if you have someone who might look like the category of people that are typically false experts saying that, no, 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 it's a problem, then that might actually break through to people uh, more effectively. So that's actually maybe something that we could consider for the door to door, uh, but that's a great point for sure, yeah. Oh, after four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, sorry. When Michael B. Jared today announced that he wants to hear the other song, where is his brain? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, the, I, so Sean uh, told me about Patrick Moore today. I wasn't paying attention to that. But uh, I mean, what it does suggest is that Whatever, I'm not going to take a stance on it, whatever. Freedom of speech is great. But the, the, the suggestion from the talk is essentially, you know, we need to tell these people to shut the hell up. Or like, not force them to shut the hell up, but we have to be aware of who the sources are. Is Patrick Moore a climate scientist? No. Why is he giving talks about climate science? I don't know, and why would you want to go to it? But whatever. So I mean, that's, that is, if, if there's a message that you give people is be aware of who's giving you what information, what interests they have, and are they someone are, are they an engineer that would build a bridge, right? Is, is this someone that you would expect that someone would call if they needed help uh, on this specific issue? If the answer is no, then, you know, why do we need to hear from them? That's my take. Do you have a take on it, Sean? No, no, I'm not. I have a question for you, though, and, um, and then Sarah has an announcement, and then we'll wrap. So uh, last August, the uh, Cogs magazine put out a climate issue, and 
and, and I bought uh, 15 copies at in, Indigo and gave them to um, my friends who are conservative. And uh, kind of along the lines of think of what you're suggesting here, and it, you know, it's a non-threatening source, I think, for them. But what I found is that people didn't want to read it, really. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm wondering, how do you take that next step? Yeah, that's hard. I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's very difficult. I don't know. You can't make people read something they don't want to read. Uh, and that's a part of the digging your head in the stand, but it's a different form of deliberate ignorance. It's not that they're taking information in and turning it around and spinning it out in a different sort of way, it's that they're kind of like blocking themselves to it. Um, and so, but that's an intractable problem, so, sort of. Like, I don't have a solution to that. I don't know how to do research on people that won't, uh, that, you know, don't consider information. Like, it's not possible to, to look into. So, uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. I don't know what the answer to it is, but if you figure it out, let me know. Collect your Nobel Prize at the door or whatever. <laughs> <laughs>